Um, okay, great. So I, where were we last time? So last time we spent a little bit of time thinking about what could or should privacy mean in a setting where we have a database of sensitive information and we want to do some sort of computations on it. And we arrived at this really interesting looking notion of differential privacy. I'll just remind you sort of what's going on with this definition. What differential privacy is, is it's a restriction on the behavior of an algorithm that takes databases and produces some sort of outcome on the basis of those databases. And, and what it says about that algorithm and how its behavior is restricted is it says that the algorithm has to treat neighboring da databases similarly. So what's neighboring databases that differ in one person's information, so addition or removal of a person. And what does it mean to treat them similarly? It means that, it, that the algorithm needs to induce almost exactly the same distribution over outcomes. So these are gonna be randomized algorithms that sample from these distributions and the distributions over outcomes from which they sample have to look very similar when the inputs to the algorithm look similar, okay? So this is our notion of differential privacy. Um, and as I mentioned very briefly in passing in the last lecture, um, this is a notion that emerged in 2006, took a little while to get a sort of traction in the real world. There was a lot of really beautiful theory going on for a period of time and not a lot of people using the notion. But um, in recent years, we see differential privacy getting a fair amount of attention in the real world, a fair amount of sort of large scale deployment. So in the context of Google Chrome um, and uh, elsewhere in Google, we see a number of deployments of differential privacy over recent years um, in the context of uh, Apple's iPhone, doing things like um, trying to predict what words you're gonna type next, stuff like that. They don't really want access to everything you're typing on your phone. Um, so thinking about how to use differential privacy to provide some pro protection for that kind of data, to do that kind of work. Um, and you see that it's sort of, become a, an advertising scheme, you know, differential privacy means that, you know, everything is fine and, and you're protected. Um, and you ought to ask differential privacy with what epsilon and what delta. Okay, so, so back, back to the notion of differential privacy. Um, why do we like it so much? Why has it actually started to get traction um, in the real world? Well, a number of reasons. Um, but some of them are really due to its fundamental mathematical properties. So the next thing I want to do is introduce you to three really nice mathematical properties that this stability or robustness notion that, that is differential privacy that this, no, that this notion enjoys. So the first property um, that I want to pay attention to is this notion of group privacy. So what do I mean by this? I'm gonna say it in words and then we can make sense of the, the characters on the screen together. So what do I mean by this? Uh, well, so differential privacy, as I described it to you, was a promise of privacy for a single individual. It was saying to an individual, if you were to remove yourself from the database, then the results wouldn't change by very much. But what if you're worried about the privacy, not just of one people, but of a small group of people, like everybody in your family? Um, what does differential privacy say for them? And the really nice thing is that differential privacy immediately gives a guarantee of privacy to small groups where the quality of the privacy guarantee degrades naturally with the size of the group of people you're trying to protect. So in particular, if you have an algorithm that's epsilon comma differentially private um, and you're wondering how much can its behavior change if I were to add or remove K people from the underlying database, the answer is that you get a change in the behavior of the algorithm that looks instead of like a multiplicative e to the epsilon, instead like a multiplicative e to the epsilon times k. Okay, so this immediately tells you that di the differential privacy tells you something about group privacy. I'm not going to prove this for you because you're going to prove this on the homework, but if there are questions about what this means, I want to take them now. Sorry, I have another question. So what is a, like a typical um, parameter I should imagine for epsilon is like a function of, of the size of the, should it depend on the size of the universe or is it some universal constant? That is a great question. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of answers and none of them are going to be 100% satisfying. So the first answer is the math doesn't tell you. The math 
just gives you an epsilon and it's up to you to interpret that epsilon and decide what is an acceptable level of epsilon. So there's nothing in the definition of differential privacy or in its properties that really inherently guides the choice of epsilon. So that was a terribly unsatisfying answer. Um, a slightly more satisfying answer, but still unsatisfying answer. Okay, I'll give you at least three unsatisfying answers. The second one is, um, we tend to talk about epsilon values of 0.2, occasionally one, and we tend to laugh at people who use epsilon values of 10, 100, things like that. Why? Kind of social convention, kind of what's emerged from having thought a little bit about what it looks like in particular settings, the type of guarantee that you get. Third answer, it probably should depend on the context. Um, some contexts are more sensitive than others. And I don't think there is a right answer. Um, and it should probably depend on a careful analysis of what is considered acceptable risk and what you're trading off in order to, to get that level of risk. So differential privacy, as we will see, does not come for free. In order to achieve a particular level of differential privacy, you are needing to sacrifice, in some sense, some degree of accuracy, or in other words, you're needing more data than you otherwise would have needed to achieve the same level of accuracy. So differential privacy is not coming for free. It's a trade-off. And what the math does is it doesn't tell you what's the right trade-off. It tells you what's the frontier of possible trade-offs. And then it's up to you or society to decide which point on this frontier is the right one. So I told you those were all going to be totally un unsatisfying answers, but that's what I got. Great question. Other questions at this point? I have a related question to the previous one. Um, yeah. Are there any like parametric algorithms to attack on differential privacy whose running time, for example, depends on epsilon or whose guarantees depend on epsilon? So one could like like turn the knob on epsilon, depending on those? So I said, say the beginning of the question a little bit more slowly. Are there algorithms, oh, and I missed a word. Uh, sorry, yeah, like algorithms um, designed to attack, for example, forms of differential privacy, whose running time depends on epsilon, for example, or, or whose guarantees that depend on epsilon. That is an interesting question. So sort of reconstruction types of algorithms or some, somehow that would, that would, basically acknowledge that I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that has that flavor to it, but I'll think about it. If I, if I think of something, I'll let you know. Because uh, like you said at some point that, um, for example, a value of 10 like would be uh, probably a bad choice, but I guess I'm wondering like, how do we know that, for example, like what happens if I choose 10 as my epsilon? Like, does that mean that- right, Yeah, good, okay, so let's think concretely. I mean, what happens? Well, what happens is now we have an algorithm that is allowed to make really, really big changes um, when we change just one person's data. Um, so as you make the epsilon bigger, the algorithm's less constrained. And so now we're allowed to have an e to the 10, which is a pretty big number. I mean, you know, I, I don't know relative to what, but it looks like a pretty big number to me. Um, multiplicative a uh, factor in, uh, in sort of the change in probabilities of outcomes. So suppose we were in a world where, you know, say there are two outcomes, we're gonna say yes or no as a result of the algorithm. It's a pretty simple world. Um, now under one database that has me in it, you know, the, the algorithm can say no with, you know, one in 20 chance. Um, and then with the algorithm without me, it can say no with a much higher probability. Is that a problem? It looks pretty bad to me. It means that an algorithm that is able to pretty effectively basically raise a red flag when, you know, for my presence in the database is allowed to be called differentially private. That sounds pretty bad to me. But the exact point at which, you know, it becomes unacceptable that like sort of the acceptable level of difference in probabilities, I think that's context dependent. But does that help a little bit? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks. It's a good question. Um, other questions about group privacy or about anything at this point? There's another question in the chat. Maybe I can read it for you. Yeah, gladly, thank you. So Tomas Gonzalez is asking, 
the distance means that it, it has to be exactly k adds or removals or it can be a combination of adds and removals. Great, yeah, so, that, so we're allowed to have a combination of k adds and removals. Um, and actually I should warn you, um, they, they're sort of hiding in the literature um, another slightly different version of differential privacy. And most of the time, it doesn't make a huge difference which version you're looking at, but it's a little confusing and sometimes it does matter. So let me point this out. So I've been talking about neighboring databases as databases that differ in the addition or removal of one person. But actually a lot of the differential privacy literature treats the size of the database as fixed, some fixed size N and thinks about a neighboring database as one where somebody gets changed. So instead of adding or removing, we remove and add um, to get to a neighboring database of the same size. It's, you know, in some sense, it's a difference of, you know, one action versus two going in one direction. The other implication actually doesn't completely hold. You can usually work around it. Don't worry about it too much. Just want to warn you that it's out there lurking in the literature. Um, other questions? Um, can I think of group privacy like intuitively as the regular different privacy says I can remove or add one person, but if, if I keep extending that like inductively, I remove one person and then remove the next person and then remove the next person, eventually I'm not, I'm, I'm going to get less differentially private each time. Exactly. Is, is that yeah. sort of where the multiplicative That's exactly factor? the intuition and it's so good. I want, don't want you to say anything more because that's the answer to the homework. Uh, you got it. Um, <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on to the next property of differential privacy that I wanted to point out to you. Um, and that is post-processing. Again, I'll tell you in words, then we'll make sense of what's on the slide. Okay. So what's the idea here? Uh, the idea is that if I do something that's differentially private and then somebody comes along and they look at the result of my algorithm, and they think really hard and they have lots of cool outside information and they have extensive computational power. No matter what they do, they can't degrade the differential privacy guarantee. So that's either sounds like totally wild or totally obvious to you. Um, so why is this? So basically what's going on here is if I do something that's differentially private, Unless the subsequent computation goes back and looks at the database or has access to the randomness of my algorithm, I assume both of those are, are disallowed, then any subsequent com uh, computation can in some sense only further collapse the information that's available to an observer. It can't create more information about the underlying database. So this is something um, that we are going to prove together it's gonna be our first proof of differential privacy. Okay, so let me give myself a page and now we can do this. Okay, so what's, what's the proof here? So I'm gonna give you in the process of doing this, I'm gonna give you sort of a formula for how to do a proof of differential privacy. Um, and this is going to be sort of your fallback when you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, that something's differentially private. You actually, in some sense, are pretty constrained um, and you're going to, you know, sort of follow this formula repeatedly. Um, there's still be room for creativity, but it's, it's good to know sort of the basic structure of things. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do for my proof is I'm going to just do the deterministic post-processing version of, of this algorithm. So I'm going to consider just some post-processing function that's deterministic instead of randomized. And you should tell me when my handwriting gets so awful that you can't read it. But can you at least see it right now? Even if you can't read it? Okay, great. Um, okay, so what do we need to do uh, for a proof of differential privacy? The first thing we need to do is we need to fix two neighboring databases because differential privacy says something about what we're allowed to do on neighboring databases. So we're going to fix, let's call them X and Y, um, neighboring databases. The next thing we need to do 
is we need to fix some subset of the outcome space that we're going to look at. Okay. And now that you have your neighboring databases and now that you have your subset of the outcome space, you want to say something about how the mechanism behaves in the first database versus how it behaves on the second database. Okay. Um, for convenience, for this particular proof, while this is not part of sort of your universal formula, we're going to give ourselves a, a language. We're going to let, we're going to give ourselves some new notation. Let T be the set of elements of R such that F of R is in S. Okay. So again, so what's going on in this notation? Uh, we have some mechanism M that maps databases to outcomes in R. We assume that it's differentially private. Then we take some new function that takes elements of R, maps them to elements of R prime. And we want to claim that the composition of F and M is still differentially private. The privacy uh, didn't degrade at all. Okay. So now this composition takes databases and returns an element of R prime. And so now what we're doing is we say, okay, consider X and Y neighboring databases, consider S some subset of this outcome space, because remember, we want to show that this composition is differentially private. Now we've named T to be the set of elements of R that get mapped to elements of S. Okay, good. So now what are we going to do? We want to say something about the probability that F of M of X lands in S. We don't know very much. What do we know about the probability that f of m of x lands in s? Well, we just gave it a name. So let's use that name. That's equal to the probability that m of x lands in t, right? OK. What do we know about the probability that m of x lands in t? Well, we know almost nothing about m, except that we know that it is epsilon delta differentially private. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this is going to be less than or equal to e to the epsilon times the probability that m of y lands in t plus this delta. Okay. What do we know about that? Well, we know what t is because we named it ourselves. So we know that's equal to e to the epsilon times the probability that what? That f of m of y lands in s plus delta. Are we done with the deterministic post-processing argument? Answer is yes, but before you declare victory, I want you to do one sanity check. I want you to check that your proof of differential privacy did not rely in some way on some asymmetry between your X and your Y, those two neighboring databases. Was there something special about the X that made me start with the X? Or, was, or were the X and the Y absolutely symmetric? And in this argument, the X and the Y were completely symmetric. We didn't use any special properties of the X versus the Y. You know, one, one wasn't the bigger database or the smaller database. It worked in both directions. So we're good. If you want to then extend this proof, to work uh, for an F. Basically, what you do is you say that you have F that you know, can be de decomposed into a convex combination of deterministic functions, and you apply the same argument we just did. Okay, So that together gives you, I'm going to call victory, um, gives you your proof that differential privacy enjoys this guarantee of post-processing. Questions here? So sorry, why is F? In the theorem, why does it randomize? I, um... Why does it also work for a randomized f? No, no. I mean, it looks like your proof works for any f, right? Or yeah. So I was just being very. So I was being very. I sort of pedantic about this. So I did this first for a determin deterministic f, um, and I was looking at the outcomes of this. I was, you know, sort of looking exactly at this. F as being something that maps to particular outcomes. And I was sort of following that process backwards here to, you know, in this process of naming the, the T. Um, and now I want to say, okay, what about an F that, that's randomizing? You can use the same argument. 
Um, and you can use this argument if you want to get sort of careful about it. What you do is you use this argument by first saying, well, the F can be written as a convex combination of these deterministic functions. Okay, so next property that I want to show you is the composition property. Again, let me tell you what it means, then we'll try to make sense of it. And actually, there are a bunch of different versions of composition. So the one I'm gonna tell you about and that we're gonna prove here is the simplest version, but I also wanna tell you about um, how you can get to cooler and stronger composition statements. I suspect we're not gonna have time this week to prove anything fancier than this one, um, but the other ones are really cool. Okay, so what is composition? Composition is the theorem that lets us reason about if I do something that's differentially private over here and I do something that's differentially private over here, how can I talk about the privacy guarantee of the combination of these computations, okay? So I did more than one computation potentially on the same database. How do I talk about the overall privacy guarantee? And intuitively what the composition theorems tell you is at a high level, the privacy harms add up nicely when you do multiple differentially private computations. So literally the composition theorem that I have here on the theorem is one that says that literally the guarantees add up. So the, the composition theorem that I have in front of us here says that if I do a sequence of computations on a database, each of which is some epsilon comma delta uh, differentially private algorithm, then overall I can, I can show that I pay you know, k epsilon comma k delta differential privacy if that was k computations. So it turns out actually, you could show something stronger than this. But first let's appreciate this theorem um, and why it's cool and useful. This theorem, I think of it as useful because it's the theorem that says that the way we're going to and construct complicated sophisticated algorithms is first we're going to construct simple differentially private building blocks, these little Lego bricks. And basically once you have a vocabulary of simple differentially private algorithms, you can assemble them into more complex algorithms. And your privacy analysis is gonna be really, really easy. Your privacy analysis is basically gonna be adding up the privacy guarantees of the Lego bricks that you used. Um, and that's basically how the literature has built up sophisticated algorithms is there's a handful of primitives. And I'm actually gonna to try to expose you to most of the fundamental differentially private uh, primitives. There's a handful of primitives in the literature that get used over and over and over again. And they get assembled in creative ways to build more sophisticated algorithms. Uh, so composition is really sort of fundamental uh, to differential privacy. The more sophisticated versions of composition are fundamental as well. So let me tell you what I mean by more sophisticated. So it's more, there's more sophisticated versions in two ways. Um, one of them is that actually you can show the composition guarantees still hold even if your choice of the second algorithm to run is based on the results of the previous algorithm. So even if your choice of the subsequent computations is adaptive, that may not sound particularly important uh, to you at the moment. However, this ends up having massively important implications, um, actually, even if you don't care about privacy. If you reinterpret differential privacy as a stability guarantee, it turns out you can prove some really beautiful theorems that giving a guarantee of differential privacy about a sequence of adaptively chosen computations ensures that that sequence of adaptively co chosen computations will not overfit the data on which it's uh, been run. Um, and that sort of robustness against adaptivity ends up being incredibly powerful um, for, for thinking about overfitting and generalization, um, even outside of the world of differential privacy. Um, so that's one really cool strengthening of the composition theorem. The other one is it turns out once we're talking about epsilon comma delta differential privacy, so we allow ourselves not just a multiplicative change in probabilities, but also an additive change in probabilities. Once we have that delta, you can do better than just add up and the deltas add up. Actually, you can get composition theorem 
that looks more like square root of k in front of the epsilon. Um, and so that ends up being really powerful for being able to build sort of more sophisticated algorithms that need far less data or that get far better um, accuracy guarantees. Okay. Questions before we try to prove the basic version of the composition theorem. Okay. This Let's do it. Root, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you didn't go for it. Yeah, of, yeah. The square root of k that you just mentioned is that best possible or? Yeah, that's that's the best that you're going to get. Um, and it's it also. It, it, it butts up against sort of what's possible in a number of ways, not just if you're worried about uh, privacy, but also for some of those sort of uh, data science consequences of the stability notion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that shouldn't be immediately obvious to you by any means. It's a, it's a good question. Um, okay, cool. So let's try to prove that we have this composition theorem. We're gonna prove the simplest version. We're actually just gonna do it for epsilon comma zero differential privacy. Um, and again, we're gonna, we're gonna just do it for two algorithms. So one's differentially, epsilon one differentially private, the next one's epsilon two differentially private. We're not gonna look at adaptivity. We're not gonna get into that cool thing about the square root of K that I just mentioned. We're just gonna do the simplest version, but hopefully it will convince you that um, there's something interesting going on here composition wise. Okay, so what's the theorem? Um, I'll write it in my own ways. So let M Let's call it M1, take databases and give you elements of R1 and be epsilon one DP. And let's say we have an M2 that takes databases and returns elements of R2 and let's call it epsilon two DP. Then I wanna claim that this mechanism, which I'll call M12 that takes databases and returns an element of R1 and an element of R2. And what it does is literally, you know, run both of the algorithms. So there's nothing adaptive here. So the claim is you can add up the epsilons, okay? What's the proof? Well, I already told you how you have to start your proof of differential privacy. What do I have to do? I have to consider a pair of neighboring databases. So let x1, or let, let me call them x and y, be neighboring databases. What else do I have to do? I have to fix some subset of the outcome space, right? Okay. Here, I'm about to leverage something cool that you're gonna prove on the homework. I hope you give me permission. So on the homework I mentioned yesterday, if you haven't already done it, you will this week prove that in the context of epsilon comma zero differential privacy, it's equivalent to restrict behavior on singletons of the outcome space rather than on subsets of the outcome space. So I'm gonna leverage that fact here and I'm just gonna fix a singleton of the outcome space, okay? So I'm gonna fix any outcome, let's call it R1, R2, the pair. Okay, you let me do that. You guys will prove it, it's gonna be okay. All right, so then what do I do? Well, I wanna relate the probability that my mechanism maps X to this outcome to the probability that my mechanism maps Y to this outcome. That's all I've gotta do. I'm gonna do it a slightly different way. I'm gonna write a slightly different way this time. Um, when you're doing a proof of epsilon comma zero differential privacy in particular, sometimes it's nice instead of starting with the behavior on X and try to make a chain of reasoning to get to the behavior on Y, sometimes it's convenient to go between the behavior on X and the behavior on Y and show that it's bounded by E to the epsilon, okay? So let's do that. So I'm gonna look at the probability that my mechanism on X1 gives me this outcome versus the probability that I get to this outcome under Y. And again, I don't know much 
there's not a lot that I can do here. So what do I know? Well, these are just sort of two independent runs of there's no, there was no sort of complicated relationship between the two runs of the mechanism. So that's the probability that M1 on X gives me R1 times the probability that M2 on X gives me R2 divided by the probability that M1, tell me when I write something wrong, okay? You have to pay attention. M2 on Y equals R2, okay? Again, I don't know very many sophisticated things. What can I do? Well, I can kind of draw some parentheses around this and some parentheses around that, right? What do I know about this? Bounded by each to epsilon one. Yeah, why? X and Y are neighboring databases and uh, we're looking at one specific outcome and the thing that we didn't prove yet is equivalent to temperature privacy. Perfect. And then the second one bounded by e to the epsilon two, right? Are we done? You got to do the check. What was the check? Was there anything asymmetric about X versus Y? Was there? No, you're good. You finished the proof. Okay. So now you're starting to get into the routine of how you do these proofs of differential privacy. And you've seen that differential privacy has these kind of cool properties. Now we need to finally get to the point where we can start to see some algorithms that actually achieve guarantees of differential privacy. So far it's just been this sort of abstraction, right? Okay. So the first differentially private algorithm that I'm going to introduce you to is actually an algorithm that predates differential privacy. So yes. the randomized response algorithm, oh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, just very brief. I mean, uh, this proves that like two differentially private algorithms have this bound, but uh, for the composition you have to, so that's, is that part of the homework or? or uh, sorry, or... It, is, I, is which part, part of the homework? So, so that we assumed that M1 was epsilon one differentially private and M2 was epsilon two differentially private. And so that's what, what we use to get this and this. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the thing you're gonna do on the homework is the proof that it was okay that I focused just on a singleton rather than an arbitrary subset of the outcome space. Okay, but this does not address the composition of two mechanisms. Immediately, so right? this doesn't this so this is running one mechanism and then running another mechanism. It doesn't explicitly address um, running one mechanism, taking the output and putting that as the input to the next mechanism. You can do that the same way. Um, it doesn't explicitly address the harder question of taking the output of the mechanism, using that to choose the next mechanism and potentially running that on the output. That requires a whole sort of framework for thinking about adaptivity that I do not want to build up with you guys, um, but it's in the book. It's a little hard to read, honestly, uh, but it's in the book. Um, and we didn't get anywhere into, into the epsilon delta version of it, but yeah, great questions. Yeah, the, you can get more and more and more sophisticated with these, but this is just sort of the, the most basic framework. Other questions? Cool, okay. So I wanna give you your first differential private algorithm. As I was saying, the randomized response algorithm predates differential privacy. Um, it's a technique that was developed in the context of the social sciences in the 1960s. Um, what's the context? I'm a researcher, I'm trying to understand the prevalence of some embarrassing human trait or behavior. Like I wanna know what fraction of people in this population has ever cheated on their spouse or has an embarrassing disease or has ever cheated on an exam. And I could go around asking people, hey, have you ever cheated on your spouse? But it turns out people always say no when you ask them that question. Um, and I suspect that maybe the truth lies somewhere else. So, What's the idea? The idea they had was, well, let's give people some plausible deniability. So we're gonna run the following algorithm. I call you up on the phone or somehow, some other way, I'm talking to you, but I can't see what you're doing. You know, you're behind a screen or you're on the phone, something like that. 
Um, and what I do is I ask you the question, but I say, don't, don't answer it right yet. So I ask you, have you ever cheated on an exam? Don't tell me the answer. Instead, do the following. First, you're going to flip a coin. And that coin is going to tell you whether to answer my question truthfully, if say if you got tails, or whether to let the coin answer the question. So if you get tails, you tell me the truth, but you don't tell me that you got tails. I don't see what you got. And if you get heads, then you flip the coin again. And I don't see that you're flipping it again. I don't know that you're doing this. And then you answer according to the coin. So you say yes if it said heads and you say no if it said tails, okay? So half the time you tell the truth and half the time you tell me 50-50, a random answer, okay? And I don't know which case you're in. So you always have plausible deniability. When you say, yes, I've cheated on an exam, of course it was the coin talking. There's a pretty decent chance of that. Um, and so people, at least in theory, are more willing to respond according to this protocol. And then the researchers can back out from the prevalence of yeses according to this pro protocol, the prevalence of underlying yeses in the population. So that's the idea. Turns out that this is a differentially private algorithm. Okay, so I'm sort of tricking you a little bit in saying that because it's in a slightly different context than sort of the, the way that I've presented differential privacy so far. But it's just, it's so nice and it's such a, it's such a nice special case that I, I hope you'll forgive me, but let me point out how I'm trying to trick you here. Um, usually when I've been talking about differential privacy, I've talked about a database of lots of people's information and the neighboring database is adding or removing one person. Here, the concept is that I'm, as an individual who's responding to this uh, survey, I'm adding my own noise to my own response. So the metaphor here is actually that the database is just my information and the neighboring database is the world in which my information were the opposite. So the two possible databases to consider here are the one where my answer is yes, I've cheated and the one where my answer is no, I haven't cheated. And I told you like, it's not quite a perfect analogy to what we've done so far, but bear with me. Um, and the point is that what this mechanism does is it induces almost the same probability over outcomes of the mechanism under the two neighboring databases, the database where yes, I cheated versus the database where no, I didn't cheat. And that's what we need to prove here. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? So the claim is that randomized response is log three differentially private. Where on earth did that log three come from? Well, let's see. So basically, what do I need to do? I need to consider the probability of the possible outcomes under the database where I said yes versus under the database where I said no. So what's the probability that the outcome of the mechanism is going to be yes given that my true answer is yes. I know it's written on the slide, but figure it out anyway. What's the probability that the mechanism says yes, given that my truth is yes? Oh, come on, it's so easy that you're not willing to, to tell me. Give it a shot. Three quarters, like the bad case is when um, you like the first coin says that you need to flip the other coin and the second coin says that you should answer no? Exactly, yeah. So three quarters of the time I say yes when my truth is yes because half the time I say yes because it's the truth and a quarter of the time I say yes because it's the coin speaking. Exactly, yeah. So that's this three quarters here on top. And how often do I say yes when the truth is no? You did exactly the analysis. Half the time the coin answers and half of that time the coin answers no. I'm sorry, the, and half the time the coin answers the opposite of the truth. And so we get this quarter in the denominator. Similarly, we can reason about the probability that I say no given the truth is no versus the probability that I say no given the truth is yes. And we see that this ratio of probabilities is three. So we have a, because we like to talk about our guarantees as e to the epsilon, we have a log three differentially private algorithm, okay? Questions? Just a quick question. So if we were to use like the, the, the more classical definition of the, the, the previous definition of, of differential privacy, like could I, I don't know, I have a database of answers if the person cheated it or not, and I just add 
the same number of just random yes, no answers, would this have the same effect or probably not? Yeah, so great question. Good, okay, so I wanna answer that question in multiple different levels because it's such a good question. Um, so yes, one thing that we could do is we could simulate this process by gathering all of the true answers and then adding noise on behalf of each of the individuals. That would induce the same distribution over outcomes and it would therefore enjoy the same formal guarantee of differential privacy as I've written it here. But it would be perhaps a less satisfying algorithm from the perspective of the individuals because they would have to give their true embarrassing data to some researcher and trust the researcher to add the noise. It's preferable naturally from an, you know, from an individual's perspective to not have to trust anybody and to add your own noise and to give your own privacy guarantee. And algorithms that let you do that, where each individual is doing their own randomization, actually get known as locally differentially private algorithms. And we totally are not going to have time to get there this week. But actually, there's been a lot of really interesting work over the past couple of years trying to look at actually models that sit between the local model and the centralized model. But the fundamental thing to know is that the local model, where it's more, whereas it's more satisfying from the individual's perspective, and actually the big tech companies like the local model, the noise can happen on your device. You know, the noise happens here, and you never send them your embarrassing information. That's great for them for lots of reasons. Um, it turns out that for most problems, the trade-offs that you can get between privacy and accuracy in the local model are weaker than the trade-offs you can get in the centralized model where everybody hands their data over. And that makes sense because when everybody hands their data over, we can somehow do some more clever coordination of the noise. We can potentially add less noise um, because we're doing something at the aggregate level. Um, so great question. Um, and this question of what can we do if we're all willing to hand our data over to the centralized curator um, is exactly where we're going next. Okay, good. Um, so, in, yeah, yeah, in, question. In, in the proof we have here, actually the, the differing inputs are not symmetric, right? But I guess three is the upper bound, like it's three and one over three, I think. Yeah, good, good. So you want it to, you want it in both directions to be bounded by three and good. Thank you for being careful about that. That's exactly what you observe is that um, if, if you start with the one and go to the other, you're going to get an upper bound of three. Um, and that upper bound of three holds in both directions. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. So now we want to talk about doing things in the centralized model where we all hand over our data and somebody adds noise on our behalf. And we wanna to start to think about what computations can we do? And we're gonna start with the simplest types of computations. So something where we all hand over our numbers and I, or our bits, you know, something very simple. And the centralized curator wants to compute one single, you know, numeric or maybe vector valued function on all of our inputs. And the question is, how can the curator do this with a guarantee of differential privacy? And the key intuition here is that you have to think about what does the curator have to hide in order to get a guarantee of differential privacy? And intuitively, what the curator needs to hide is the amount that that function could change if any one person were to change their input or add or remove their input data. That's what they need to hide. Because that's exactly sort of the difference that we need to hide under differential privacy. So this notion of the sensitivity of a function ends up being really useful for us here. So if the sensitivity of a function is just defined to be exactly this, the max over any two neighboring data sets of how much the value of that function can change under the two data sets. Okay. And so this is just this measure of exactly what we need to hide for the purposes of differential privacy and sort of to get some intuition for the sensitivity of a function. Um, think about a function that what it does is it returns the average of account query. So I want to know what fraction of the population um, is female or what fraction of the population is COVID positive or what fraction of the population is both female and COVID positive. Um, how much could any of those answers change 
if one person were added or removed from the data set? I'm patient. So I said fraction. So it's, yeah, one over the size of the data set. If I'd said count, it would have been one. Yeah, exactly. And we like to kind of go back and forth between talking about counts and fractions. So at some point you have to pay attention to normalization. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is it's a bounded sensitivity function. So it's the kind of thing that you might hope you might be able to do subject to differential privacy. Um, and so given that we're running low on time, I'm going to tell you what you can do to preserve the privacy. And next time we'll actually look at it a little bit more closely and understand it. Okay, so what's the idea? I'm gonna skip, skip, skip right ahead. The idea is that you can do the computation and then you can add noise to it. Not surprising, we kind of knew this was coming. What kind of noise can you add to it? Well, the first thing that we, we're gonna observe is that you can add Laplace distributed noise. If you've never seen the Laplace dis distribution, I don't blame you, it's just a doubly exponential distribution. Okay, so it's like two exponentials ran into each other. Um, why do we use this distribution? Well, intuitively, it's a distribution such that if I take a Laplace distribution and I kind of shift it over a little bit and compare the values between the two Laplace distributions, it maintains this fixed multiplicative bound on, on these two, on the sort of the difference between these two distributions. And that's exactly the behavior that we want for differential privacy. So the Laplace distribution, it's in some sense close to being, in some sense, I'm not gonna get there, but it's in some sense close to being, but not exactly the optimal distribution for the purposes of different, differential privacy. It's the very convenient distribution for this purpose. Um, since we're low on time, I will come back to the properties of the Laplace distribution next time. But the intuition is just the following, that this is this nicely sort of well, you know, highly concentrated noise that we can add. We add more concentrated noise. So we add sort of less noise when we want to give more privacy or less privacy. Less noise is less privacy. More noise, sort of flatter distribution is more privacy. And the way that we can uh, compute these single functions or these vector valued functions subject to differential privacy is by tailoring sort of how concentrated the noise is to the epsilon guarantee that we want to get. Okay. So since I'm out of time, I'm going to stop there. Next time we'll talk a little bit more about this Laplace distribution and we'll move on to doing some more sophisticated things with differential privacy. But um, I'll take questions if there are more questions now.